Hello and welcome. I'm Fernando, a GP in the UK. Today, I will touch on a subject which is not really covered by NICE, which is the concept of hypertensive urgency, as opposed to hypertensive emergency. It is an interesting subject, which we're going to illustrate with a practical case. For this, I have consulted a number of medical publications and guidelines, and the links are in the episode description. Right, so let's jump into it. So let's start with some definitions. Severe hypertension is defined as a systolic blood pressure of 180 or more and a diastolic blood pressure of 120 or more. Hypertensive emergency is defined as severe hypertension associated with evidence of target organ damage. And hypertensive urgency is defined as severe hypertension without evidence of ongoing end organ damage. Studies have shown that hypertensive urgency is two to three times more common than hypertensive emergencies. We know from the Hypertension NICE guideline that for people with a blood pressure of 180 over 120 or higher, we should investigate for target organ damage. That is, we have to differentiate between hypertensive urgency and hypertensive emergency. Starting with the history, we should look at possible causes and non-compliance with antihypertensive medication is the most common precipitating factor. Other possible factors include excess alcohol, anxiety or panic, drugs either prescribed, over-the-counter or illicit, like cocaine, amphetamines, sympathomimetic agents, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and high-dose steroids. We will need to consider the past medical history. Systematic reviews have concluded that hypertensive crises occur more often if there is a history of CKD, coronary heart disease, stroke and congestive heart failure. And therefore, checking whether the patient has this diagnosis is important because they represent both risk factors and consequences of severe hypertension. In terms of examination, we will ensure that the blood pressure reading is correct. That is, we will take the measurements in both arms making sure that the cuff is the correct size and take at least two or three readings in the arm with a higher blood pressure. A study has shown that in up to a third of patients with severe hypertension, the blood pressure falls to less than 180 over 120 after 30 minutes of quiet rest. So, if feasible, we should also try this. And in the history and examination, we will look for signs and symptoms of possible end organ damage. So, in the eye, we will look for symptoms and signs of retinopathy, such as blurring or loss of vision, dizziness, retinal hemorrhage and papilledema. In the central nervous system, we will look for symptoms and signs of hypertensive encephalopathy, intracerebral hemorrhage or ischemic stroke, such as headache, nausea, vomiting, confusion, seizures, visual disturbance, focal deficit, dysphagia, abnormal or loss of sensation, changes in mental status like agitation or lethargy, and ataxia. In the aorta, we will look for symptoms and signs of aortic dissection, such as acute severe back pain or chest pain, radiating to the back, unequal peripheral pulse or blood pressure measurements, and diastolic murmur of aortic insufficiency. In the chest, we will look for symptoms and signs of acute coronary syndrome, such as chest pain and shortness of breath, and of acute pulmonary edema, such as shortness of breath, elevating jugular venous pressure, decreased lung sounds, hypoxemia, tachypnea, and bibasal crackles. And finally, in the kidneys, we will look for symptoms and signs of acute kidney injury, such as oliguria, hematuria, and proteinuria. If there are any symptoms or signs of target organ damage, we will refer the patient to hospital as an emergency. It is worth saying that according to NICE, we should send the patient to hospital too if the patient has suspected pheochromocytoma based on symptoms, for example, labile or postural hypotension, headaches, palpitations, pallor, abdominal pain or diaphoresis. Otherwise, without concerning symptoms or signs, as we know, we should carry out initial investigations such as urea and electrolytes, a full account, HbA1c, lipid profile and thyroid function tests, urine dipstick for blood and protein as well as albumin creatinine ratio, fundoscopy and if we are unsure we could consider urgent optician retinal photography or an ophthalmological assessment, a chest x-ray, an ECG, 
and an echocardiogram if there is evidence of left ventricular hypertrophy on ECG. Okay, so this is all very good in theory, but let's put it into practice with a fictitious case. A 54-year-old Caucasian woman without known hypertension comes to see you for an unrelated problem and you decide to check her blood pressure. Her blood pressure is 200 over 130. She's otherwise asymptomatic. On examination, fundoscopy and the remainder of the examination is normal, including urinalysis. What should we do next? First of all, she has no symptoms of concern and no signs of end organ damage. So, assuming that the blood pressure measurement is correct and that there are no other precipitating or risk factors, the next step will be to carry out investigations for end organ damage. But in practice, we do not have immediate access to chest X-rays and in some places ECGs. Even if we can do blood tests and urine tests to check albumin creatine ratio straight away, the results wouldn't be available immediately. Besides, our fundoscopy skills may not be perfect and getting an adequate fundoscopy assessment can also take time. Does this mean that we should always send the patient to the emergency department for a full assessment? Most of us would probably find a blood pressure of 200 over 130 quite scary. Our imagination may start thinking of all the possible things that could go wrong. Neurological problems, cardiovascular events, retinal hemorrhages, and acute kidney injury amongst many others. In addition, we want to be good doctors, we want to do the best for our patients, we don't want to get patients complaints, and even less to be the subject of GMC investigations. But above all, we want to have peace of mind and sleep well at night. So what do we do? And the first thing to say is that we have to do what feels right. It is our clinical judgment, and if it feels right to send the patient to the emergency department for a full screen, then so be it. This would be particularly relevant if we consider the patient to be at high risk because of, for example, other comorbidities such as CKD, coronary heart disease, or a previous stroke. But there may be times when sending the patient to hospital may not be possible, or perhaps we will try, but the medical team may refuse to accept the patient. What do we do then? So for then, let's consider a few things. As far as we know, this patient does not have any symptoms or signs of end organ damage. NICE specifically says that when a patient does not have symptoms or signs indicating same-day referral, we should carry out investigations for the target organ damage as soon as possible. So NICE is asking us to use symptoms and signs, that is history and examination, as the basis for our assessment as to whether the patient is to be seen in the emergency department or not. What carrying out investigations as soon as possible means exactly will be open to interpretation, but we should not take it as having to be done in hospital as an emergency. Also, although repeated episodes of hypertensive urgency may have long-term complications, the immediate risk of hypertensive urgency is relatively low, and some studies have shown only one cardiovascular event per 1,000 patients in the week following the presentation. Therefore, the vast majority of these patients can be safely treated in primary care with oral antihypertensive medication. Also, in the absence of symptoms and signs of acute organ damage, there is little evidence of benefits of immediate emergency in blood and other diagnostic tests. A trial of patients presenting with hypertensive urgency in primary care showed that only 5% of ordered tests were abnormal many of them being simply indicative of poorly controlled chronic hypertension. Consequently, although recommended, for most patients these tests are not needed as an emergency. Also, most of these patients are likely to suffer from chronic hypertension. We know that many of these patients will have had very high blood pressure readings for months or even years. And we also know that for them, the blood pressure needs to be lowered slowly. Why slowly? This is because perfusion of cardiac, renal and brain tissue is tightly autoregulated in the body. And what does autoregulation mean? Autoregulation of organ blood flow refers to the physiological adaptations that allow organ perfusion to remain relatively constant across a wide blood pressure range. For example, in chronic severe hypertension, cerebral flow is maintained at similar levels as in normotensive people. 
but its autoregulatory mechanisms allow patients to tolerate high blood pressure levels without developing cerebral edema. However, precisely because of this autoregulation, if the blood pressure is lowered too quickly, these patients are at risk of cerebral hypoperfusion, and this can happen even at higher than normal blood pressure levels. Therefore, although our wish may be to see a substantial drop in blood pressure quickly, with no end organ damage, the blood pressure should be lowered gradually over a period of days to avoid hypotension, syncope, myocardial ischemia and acute kidney injury, which are commonly associated with, for example, the administration of sublingual nifedipine, which is no longer widely advocated precisely for that reason. Limited data suggests that the hypertensive patients recover normal autoregulatory responses within weeks after treatment initiation. Right, so we have decided that this patient does not necessarily need to attend the emergency department. So we will arrange investigation for end organ damage as soon as possible, which in primary care could be blood tests and albumin creatinine ratio within 24 hours, with available results generally within 48 hours. The availability of ECGs and chest X-rays may vary from practice to practice, but as long as there is no concerning symptoms, doing them within a few days may be acceptable. Equally, if we do not feel confident about our fundoscopy examination, we could arrange retinal photography via an optometrist or arrange an alternative ophthalmological assessment also within a number of days. Now that we have arranged the investigations and we have reassured ourselves that we do not need to send the patient to hospital, what do we actually do with the patient? If the patient is known to have hypertension and the severe hypertension is secondary to, for example, non-compliance with medication, then it is easy. We will restart the medication, counselling and monitoring the patient accordingly. However, for those without a previous diagnosis of hypertension, NICE says that as long as there are no signs or symptoms of end organ damage, we will confirm the diagnosis of hypertension by either repeating the blood pressure within seven days or by reviewing the home blood pressure monitoring or ambulatory blood pressure monitoring results also within seven days and then treat them if the diagnosis of hypertension is confirmed. But I know that some of you will be thinking, really? Are we really going to let the patient go home for up to a week with a blood pressure of 200 over 130, just like that? Well, NICE says review the blood pressure within seven days, so this could mean reviewing the patient much more quickly, for example, within one or two days. But I know that whilst this may be an appropriate management strategy for many patients, for others, we as doctors would feel happier if we could do something sooner. And this may also be a fair approach. In fact, although not advocated by NICE, there are other guidelines that recommend starting antihypertensive medications straight away in these situations. For example, the current guideline on the management of hypertensive crises by Worcestershire Acute Hospitals NHS Trust. So, if you're worried enough to want to start medication straight away, you could be justified doing just that, even if that means deviating from the NICE guideline. And the next question is, how should this patient be treated? Medical publications state that there is little evidence addressing directly what specific agent is best to use in the case of hypertensive urgency, that is for a blood pressure of 180 over 120 or higher without evidence of end organ damage. This patient is Caucasian and she is under 55 years of age, so according to NICE we should start her an H inhibitor or an ARB. But this is where some of the guidelines also differ. For example, some guidelines recommend starting what they call rapid antihypertensive agents. For example, the Worcestershire guideline advocates starting a 10 to 20 mg daily dose of oral slow-release nifedipine if a patient is not on a calcium channel blocker because it can be titrated up as required and it has a faster onset of action compared to onlodipine. When switching to amlodipine, they also recommend an overlap of one or two days during which a patient can receive both nifedipine and amlodipine to allow for the latter to reach adequate therapeutic levels before stopping nifedipine. To minimize the risk of cerebral hypoperfusion, an initial blood pressure target of 160 over 100 within 6 to 24 hours is generally recommended. After that, in general, 
Once the hypertensive urgency has been addressed, the treatment options should be guided by the NICE recommendations. Worcestershire Acute Hospital NHS Trust has created a simple flowchart which you will be able to find in the episode description. Let's have a look at it. So if the patient has severe hypertension, we will ask ourselves if there is evidence of end organ damage. If the answer is yes, then we will treat this as a hypertensive emergency. We will admit the patient and consider lowering the blood pressure with IV medication. If on the other hand, there is no evidence of end organ damage, then we will treat this as hypertensive urgency that may not need admission and may be treated with oral medication. This could be nifedipine slow release orally or simply restarting usual antihypertensive medication in the case of non-compliance. In summary, we must distinguish hypertensive emergency from hypertensive urgency. Short-term risk for serious cardiovascular events is minimal with hypertensive urgency and most of these patients can be safely treated in the primary care setting. Referral to the emergency department aggressive blood pressure reduction and immediate diagnostic tests are generally unwarranted unless we have specific concerns. Blood pressure control is best achieved with initiation or adjustment of long-acting oral antihypertensive medications, although more rapid agents such as oral slow-release nifedipine can be used if a faster onset of action is necessary. We should also consider and address any other possible precipitating factors. Right, so this is it, a review of hypertensive urgencies. We have come to the end of this episode. Remember that this is not medical advice and it is only my summary and my interpretation of the guidelines. You must always use your clinical judgment. Thank you for watching and goodbye.